All right, well, welcome back to another fun-filled day of physics. And um, we are going to pick up where we left off, still talking about gases and um, how they behave. Um, so I'm going to remind you a little bit about where we were last time before we move too much further. But um, before I go there, any questions, um, anything that you got questions about we've been talking about? All right, well, I will take silence as we are doing all right there. Okay, so let's just kind of review where we got last time. So we're talking about gases and um, we kind of have to treat these differently than solids and liquids because they, um, they definitely behave differently, especially when it comes to temperature and thermodynamics. So really what we did last time was construct everything kind of from the start, right? Like, excuse me, we started with looking at the collisions of gas molecules with the sides of containers and what that does with pressure and velocity and all that kind of stuff. And so we found out that the mean velocity um, was really just dependent upon temperature. So it's kind of an interesting fact. Um, but, uh, and, and that velocity then leads to kinetic energy um, and so really what we want to think about when we're talking about gases is, is as the temperature changes, the average kinetic energy of the particles and then even the total kinetic energy is being affected. And so that's what temperature really is. You can think of it as a measure of kinetic energy in terms of the gas. Now, it doesn't quite play out the same way when we get to liquids and solids. Um, and that's because what we derived for gases allowed for particles that could just move wherever they wanted. And of course, when we get into liquid and solid form, there are bonds between these molecules. So there's a little bit of restriction in terms of motion. And so they behave differently. But then we can go back to what we talked about in the first chapter on thermodynamics um, and uh, things like specific heat and all that uh, for solids and liquids. Okay. Well, anyway, um, enough kind of preaching the differences, but let's kind of keep going with where we were last time and let's move on to that next step. So I'm going to switch to the whiteboard. All right, so um, let's go back to what we've done so far and um, where we got. So uh, a couple of the important things that we hit last time. All right, so um, first of all, let's talk about this in terms of, um, well, let's start with the ideal gas law. So I wanna remind you about that. And that tells us the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. And so there were two different forms. Um, this again is the one that we see most often, the PV equals NRT. Um, so P and V are your pressure and your volume. T is your temperature, but I do want to remind you that this needs to be in Kelvin. So we want to go to the Kelvin scale, um, but that's pretty easy from Celsius because we're just off by 273. So you can take your uh, Celsius temperature and add 273 and that'll give you your Kelvin. Um, so pressure, volume, and temperature. And then N and R, R is just a constant, okay? It's the ideal gas constant. Um, it's actual number, you can always look up. Don't worry about trying to memorize it or anything. And then N, this was the number of moles. So this is a measure of how much of this we have. And in terms of what a mole is, there was that thing called Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's how many molecules are in a mole of something. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a mole of carbon dioxide molecules or a mole of sand grains or whatever. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a mole always has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of them. Again, not a number that you need to memorize. Don't stress too much about that. Okay, well anyway, so here was our ideal gas law. There was also that other one that involved big N, which was the number of molecules. And instead of R, 
It had Boltzmann's constant, that little KB, <clears throat> excuse me. But uh, anyway, so the ideal gas law. So we started with that. We kind of used that. We, um, we built that. And then um, another thing that we saw, which was kind of a big deal, is the kinetic energy. And so with kinetic energy, we saw, first of all, the average kinetic energy. So we'll go K bar. So this is the kinetic energy in one um, of these things uh, was equal to three halves times RT. Um, actually, let's just go to the total kinetic energy. So the total kinetic energy in the gas, it depends on the number of moles. It's three halves nRT. And we basically derive that using um, the velocities and stuff that we found and um, the ideal gas law. Right, so that was overall, which then means that for a single one, So I'm going to put K with a bar over it because this was the average kinetic energy. Um, and we found out that that was equal to three halves times that Boltzmann constant times T. Okay. So depending upon whether we're talking about a single one or all together, we have this. So that's what I was getting at before where I was saying the temperature, because everything else is constant, the temperature itself defines how much energy we've got in a molecule. So either this average um, or total. But do please remember that this is average. Okay, This is the mean kinetic energy. So it is possible to have uh, particles in this gas that have a greater kinetic energy and also a lower kinetic energy. But on average, it ends up being three halves KBT. All right, so that's where we were. But let's start talking about now um, the other things that matter. And I'm going to start with specific heat. So real quick quiz for class. What is specific heat? Because we did talk about this with other things last chapter. What is specific heat? I just want everybody's frantically looking at their notes and thumbing back and trying to find it. Well, how about this? Maybe I'll help you a little bit. Um, we talked about two main classifications of heat. We talked about specific heat, and we talked about latent heat. Does that help you at all? Uh. Okay, well, at least I know Ian's still alive because I heard him. The rest of you, I'm not so sure about. <laughs> okay, so uh, Caesar just gave us a little formula. It says Q equals CM delta T. And um, that definitely is the formula, right, where we take, like, I C, which is called the uh, – um, the specific heat capacity, we multiply it by the mass, and then we've got the delta T. And so kind of where I was going here for what specific heat is, specific heat, that's the energy that we need to change temperature. Okay, that's how much energy we need to put in to actually have the um, element change temperature. Latent heat, 
that's the heat that's required to make it change state <clears throat> to go from solid to liquid or liquid to gas or vice versa if we talk about how much gets removed. Okay, so again, just remember specific heat, this is energy needed to change temperature. Okay, so uh, we do know that if we kind of go back to how it was defined, look at what, what Caesar put into the chat, that there's going to be, I'll call it DQ, we'll go differential here, but DQ, um, there has to be some sort of a molar specific heat. And we're gonna define it for gases as N times CV times delta T. And I want you to notice that this is slightly different because if we go back to the one before, we had mass instead of N. And so this guy CV, we call this the molar specific heat. And it's called molar specific heat because it's based on the number of moles that are in here. It's not based on mass, it's based on moles. So the units of this, you can probably build them or help me build them. Uh, we need to end with joules. So we have joules on top. We have to cancel out the moles. So that goes on the bottom, mole goes on the bottom. And then the delta T, Temperature is in Kelvin. So CV is in joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, now where we're gonna go with this is think about what we just saw with gases, that any change in temperature is a change in kinetic energy, leads to a change in kinetic energy. Well, the change in temperature is coming from this change in energy, this heat. And so for the gas, this is for gases, right? For gases, we know that this change in heat has to equal the change in kinetic energy. So what that means is that we can actually equate these guys. We can equate just our specific heat form with the kinetic energy form that we saw along the way as we were deriving that last time. So putting that together, what we get is that N times CV times DT, I guess technically that delta I put up there should have been a D. If we're gonna go with differential chunk, so we got N times CV times delta T. That's gonna equal three halves N times R times delta T. So if you're curious where that on the right is coming from, um, again, that's what I was just talking about a minute ago, a review from last time, we saw that it's kinetic energy. So all kinds of stuff cancels out here. The N's go away, the DT's go away. And so what we end up with is CV equals three halves R. So I'm gonna put a box around that. Mostly because when I put something in a box, it means we're done. So yeah, we're done here. But also this is kind of an important result. So first of all, what this tells us is the specific heat for gases, always the same. 
It's just what? it's just three halves of the gas constant. Yeah, it's just three halves of that guy yeah, of that gas constant. It wow. ends up that this is approximately twelve point four seven. But pretty much whether you're looking at helium versus argon versus whatever, you're gonna get the same specific heat. And that should be a little bit weird. That is weird. Right? Because like we saw with metals, different metals heat up in different ways, right? And so um, same thing's going to happen with if we've got wood versus marble versus whatever, right? We should expect that there's a, a slightly different specific heat because they don't all behave the same way. Okay. Well, I'm only kind of, I'm telling you a partial truth here. So when I write here that this CV is equal to three halves R, that's only true for the gases that we assumed we had when we built this. So remember that we had all those assumptions. We made a list of like six of them or something. One of the assumptions was that we were treating them as point masses. So this idea of using three halves R is really, really good if we have a monatomic gas. So a gas is made up of only one molecule or uh, one atom. Okay, so um, I'm going to put here monatomic. We get that CV is equal to three halves R. And just to be clear, monatomic is like O2, right? No, O2 would be diatomic because there are two oxygen molecules that go together. So like H2 or O2, those are diatomic, as would be carbon monoxide, because it's got a C and an O. Monatomic really means just by itself. So uh, good examples of this are the um, inert gases. The noble gases, let me put So things like argon, helium, xenon, because those things, um, they don't bind with anything. Uh, I'll go chemistry here for a second. So Bradley, as you know, um, their valence shell is full. So since their valence shell is full, they don't form bonds or they don't naturally want to form bonds. So they would just be by themselves. So like if we were to look at helium, it's a bunch of single helium as opposed to something like oxygen, the oxygen that, uh, that we breathe that we're, can you see that's O2. And so if you think about what that would look like, here are your two O's, but they're bound together. So that's not monatomic anymore. That's what we call diatomic. Okay. All right. So if we have a monatomic gas, all of their specific heats are right around 12.47. They're really quite close. Now, you go to something like oxygen and its value, its um, specific heat, its CV, is something like 20. It's like 20 or 21, something like that, which is significantly different, right? I mean, 12.4 versus 20 or 21. Um, so something else is going on once we go diatomic. And so we probably need to talk about that a little bit. Um, but before I get there, I want to mention one more thing. You notice I put this little sub V. And we've never done that before. Before when we had um, specific heat, it was just plain old C. When we put that C sub V, what that's saying is that we're assuming constant volume.
Okay, so basically the way we would say it is it's the, the molar heat capacity at a given volume because it does change. Can you see why it changes with volume? And changes. So that actually that wouldn't change. Like if we just assumed we had the same number of molecules, we're just changing the volume. So we'll, we'll still have the same number of them. So we have the same number of moles, the same mass. But can you reason why if we say decrease the volume, we would change the specific heat? Because of the PV equals NRT equation, they're proportional to pressure and temperature? Um, a little bit, but I'm even going away from just the formula idea, just what specific heat is. So specific heat is the ability to change the temperature, right? Which is increase the kinetic energy of these particles in the gas. What would happen if we decrease the volume? There'd so be less, the same number of molecules, but in smaller space. Less area for the kinetic energy to move around. Or okay, so, so there's less space for the individuals to go around. They're going to impact with each other more. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out that the ability to transfer that, or that kinetic energy, that heat into kinetic energy, um, changes greatly with volume because now all of a sudden we've got these particles that are much closer to each other. They can interact more frequently. And so it, well, A, it throws away one of the major assumptions we made when we built PV equals NRT, which was that there's lots of space for these things to go, uh, go around in, but we could obviously change that. So it should kind of make sense that we are assuming we're at a set volume. Here it is, because as soon as you start fiddling with the volume, um, it can get a little bit crazier. Um, but we'll talk more about how we deal with changes in volume later. All right, well, anyway, so there you go. For monatomic, it's just three halves R. So then the thought is, OK, why is something like oxygen? So O2 or other diatomics like carbon monoxide or things like that. Um, why do they have different molar specific heats? Well, when scientists, when physicists were looking at this back in the day, they started noticing some patterns. And they noticed that for diatomic, they were finding that that CV was around five halves R. Now this isn't, you know, it's not always the same, but it's roughly around there. That's like 20.8 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, and so examples of diatomic again would be like H2, O2, carbon monoxide, so on. All right, and then they started looking at what about even bigger things. So let's go what we call polyatomic. So this would be gases like carbon dioxide, water vapor, ozone. I mean, all, all kinds of uh, different kinds of gases. And what they were seeing there is that they were all around seven halves R. Now, when scientists start running into something like this, and they go, all right, we're getting like the same form every time, with just a slight difference, right? It's always a multiple of R always a certain number of halves, but then that number on top is changing. So it's clearly that number on top that seems to matter. And that number on top is changing due to the structure of these. So the question was, well, what actually happened 
when we introduced a second molecule. Right now, instead of having, oh, this is perfect, I got these. So I got a baseball. So here's our monotonic, right? So now instead of having this, we've got a diatonic. And since my classroom is my office is also my exercise room, I have a dumbbell, right? Now this is pretty much what we've got. Think of these two black things. All right, the two uh, weights of my dumbbell here, those are my, say, oxygen molecules. And then they're connected by some sort of bond, right? So why is this fundamentally different than that? Now, I mean, if you're using my real life examples, you go, well, that dumbbell is way heavier and blah, blah, blah. But let's, let's, let's not worry about that, right? Because it is possible for a monatomic gas to be heavier than a diatomic, depending upon what the things actually are. Like H2 is light. One molecule of H2 is really, really light. That'd be one of those uh, fakey dumbbells, you know, where they've got the balloons that say, you know, 1,000 pounds and the guy's just lifting with his hand, right? Um, that would be H2, as opposed to something like xenon, radon. Ooh, radon's a great example. Radon's crazy heavy. So, don't think of it as a mass change. So clearly it's not mass that matters, but what's actually the difference? What changes when we do that? The energy required to make a bond. Okay, so we do have that, that we've got the bond involved, but the bonds are already formed, right? Like if, if we're looking at, we're just changing the temperature of, you know, O2, all those suckers are already bonded. And you're right though, Bradley, that there, something had to happen to make that occur. But we're at that stage of, that's already happened. Okay, well, this is what physicists kind of figured out. And this was the initial theory that um, then later actually was found to be true. Again, when you get to modern physics, when you talk about quantum mechanics, we'll revisit this and you'll see why it must be this way. But here was the idea. The thought was, all right, well, all of them, no matter what, have this form. We've got CV is equal to some number of halves. So I'm gonna call it D, right? It's gonna be D halves times R. And what that D is, they decided is the degrees of freedom in the molecule. All right, so I don't know if anybody's ever heard that term before, um, at least in terms of this. So let me kind of give you the, how this plays out. So a degree of freedom is basically, let's go back to that monatomic, right? So we got just helium here. The degrees of freedom are the different ways that this can move such that the state of it changes. So um, first of all, I can just like move it side to side. And now it's in a different location. It's in a different place. Like something has happened, right? So there's a degree of freedom for going left and right. There's also one for going up and down. And there's also one for going towards you and away from you, right? So there are always three degrees of freedom just due to translation, to, to moving. Okay, so then there are some other degrees of freedom. The next set is rotational. Like if we rotate this, does it look different? Does it behave differently? And so on, okay? So there's translational, there's rotational, and then there's also, um, I'm gonna call it harmonic, which is some sort of like bouncing back and forth, right? Springiness. 
So those are the main kinds of degrees of freedom that we can have. So you think about a baseball or any old just single particle, it's got three degrees of freedom, left and right, up and down, front and back. The rotation stuff, remember that this is supposed to be a point, right? It's a point. So imagine a point. If I spin a point, it doesn't look any different. It's still the same. You wouldn't know that it got spinned. Spinned. Oof. What kind of English is that? Uh, hasn't been spun. That would be late in the afternoon on a hot day when Bruce is really tired and life is going kind of rough. Kind of English. Okay. So, um, but go back to that idea. Like if I had a dot here and I were to move that dot, you come back, you, would you know that it got moved? Yeah you'd see that it's in a different spot. That's why translational is always there. But if I had a dot and I turned it, or here you go, here's a baseball. I'm gonna turn it. Close your eyes. No, I'm serious, close your eyes for a second. All right, ready, here we go. Okay, so did I turn it? Slightly. They, the answer should be, well, okay, so the answer should be can't tell, right? So if I'm holding it like this, or I hold it like, uh, trying to get it rotated just right. That's better. Okay, so I hold it like that. You can't tell that I rotated it, right? If we took this still shot versus the other one, you wouldn't know. So rotation doesn't work in this case for a degree of freedom. Okay, well, now let's go to the diatomic. All right, so uh, I got to real quick switch out my earpiece here. I'm losing my battery. Give me one second. All right, so hopefully you guys can still hear me. Technology is great until it doesn't work. I seriously think large technological companies do that on purpose. Oh, of course they do. All right, but here's the good news is I actually heard you through here, Bradley, so I know it's working now. Thank you for that test. Okay, so let's go to diatomic. And I really wish I had a lighter one of these. This is 35 pounds, so this is not super easy. Um, so here's our diatomic molecule. Now, again, we've got the three translational. I can move it left and right, up and down, front and back. All right, but now let's think about rotation. If I were to rotate this, would you see it differently? Absolutely. Yeah, so like here's a rotation that if you came back later, you'd go, oh my God, something happened. Right? So I just rotated that way. Think of it, I'm rotating in the plane of the whiteboard, basically. Right? But there's a rotation. You're going to see that. So we just added a degree of freedom. There's another rotation that you would notice. But if I rotated it this way, right? Now, in that case, you see another change. So there's another degree of freedom. So that's rotating about that axis. Now, there's a third axis I can rotate this on. And that would be the axis that goes through the handle, right? So I rotate it like this. Now, would you notice that? Okay, so Caesar, yeah, thanks. Not really, right? Like if I took a picture and then I rotated it, but I made sure that it was still in exactly the same alignment, you wouldn't notice that whatsoever. So it turns out that for the diatomic, we actually end up adding two more degrees of freedom. So let, let's kind of keep track of where we are. So for the monatomic,
we've got D equals three. All right, and so these are the, the three spatial. All right, um, so then when we went to diatomic, we get that D is equal to five. There are three spatial and two rotational. Now, the one thing that uh, I'm just going to mention that this like vibrational one, um, you know, when I was using that dumbbell as my example, it's got that rigid bar. Um, chemical bonds are not rigid like that. There is some flexibility. So what you really have going on are your two that can kind of spring back and forth. Like you can get some um, action going like that. Um, so you might go, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we add one more for the diatomic? Because it allows for that kind of um, oscillation, vibration within the molecule. Um, but it turns out, and again, you'll learn this when you get to quantum. Uh, I'm sorry I keep doing that to you, but so much of this is really uh, determined by quantum mechanics. Um, you're going to find out that that's actually not part of the play with these um, two. Okay, so then let's go to polyatomic. So polyatomic then is going to suggest that D should equal uh, seven, right? Because um, if you trust that number I gave you, which it did come from um, experimental values, we should D is e uh, see that D is equal to seven. Okay, well, in that seven are the three spatial. Because again, you take your um, carbon dioxide and you move it, you'll see it. It's still going to have rotational, but this time it actually has all three. Remember how this one, let me pull my mask back up here. Right? So this one, we lost this rotation. And that's because these two are in line. Now imagine I add a third one in here. Okay, so think about the um, two bits on the end of the mass and my ball. Those are the three. Now, if I were to rotate, again, around this axis, like I was doing before, that ball is going to rotate as well. So you would see that. So we do have that axis as well as this axis, as well as that axis. Oof, that one's hard to do. You know, three. Right, so you're gonna see all three of them. And then this one also gets the vibration. So kind of quirky, kind of weird, um, definitely interesting, but it made it so that it was really easy to see what kind of specific heats we should get. And they kind of reverse engineered this, just to be perfectly honest. They found out that they were getting these numbers. And then they went, well, what could explain it? Someone came up with the idea of degrees of freedom. And then when um, quantum mechanics started really getting developed, and uh, just so you guys know, that's like barely 100 years old. Um, when quantum mechanics really started coming out, this was one of the things that helped um, reinforce the idea of quantum mechanics. Because now we take it as for granted, right? Like all this stuff with relativity and quantum physics, we just kind of go, yep, that's how it is. But when it first started, there was a lot of question because it felt wrong. Um, just to let you know, because you, you may not know. Let me actually switch views here. I'm tired of talking to you through there. So here's the thing about quantum. The idea behind quantum mechanics is that everything is delivered in little chunks. Okay, so like we treat a lot of this as continuous. So think about like the amount of energy that we could have. So the amount of heat. We always think of it as it can be anything. Like, let's just say between 0 and 100, it literally can be any number between 0 and 100. But quantum mechanics says that's not true. That it can only take on 
certain amounts that are separated by the same little bit. So imagine we could only have steps of a half. Quantum mechanics would say, okay, you can have zero, or you could have a half, or one, or one and a half, or two, two and a half, three. But you can't have one and a quarter. You can't have pi. You can't have, you know. So that was a little disconcerting because everything seems like it's continuous, right? It could be any kind of amount. And now here comes this idea that, nope, you just get it in packets, right? I know I talk about like the conservation of energy, the money idea. Well, do the same thing here with quantum. It's like, all right, you can do things in pennies. You can never have fractional pennies, right? So if I give you money, I can only increase it by some number of pennies. Can't give you something in between. So that felt really wrong. But this was one of the ideas that, um, well, not ideas, but one of the things that they had seen that really reinforced that idea. So when we get there, and I keep saying we, I don't know that I'll be the one teaching that class. I haven't talked to Kathy about that yet. Um, but if I am, then we will talk about that. We'll revisit this. Um, if it's not me, then you with Kathy We'll revisit it, but you'll see why this must be. All right, well, anyway, so there's specific heat. All right, um, let's take a quick break. I need to actually go run to use the restroom. So I'm going to pause us here. All right, so last thing we want to talk about um, in terms of gases gets a little bit more to the velocity, which is what are the different velocities, right? Like we know that we can calculate average velocity. We can get an average kinetic energy. But what if we want to look at the particles themselves? I mean, obviously we saw that as temperature increased, the velocity increased. But do all of them increase? Do they all increase the same amount? And so on and so forth. So that's kind of the next question, is how are those velocities actually distributed. How many particles have whatever velocities that we're looking at? Okay, well, the way that this is done is super mathy, super mathy. Like, we're not going to get into it mathy. I'll kind of hit the high points. But it requires um, basically statistical analysis combined with the quantum ideas and all that. So, it's pretty gnarly, but um, it has been shown to hold experimentally. And so uh, we definitely know that it's true, even if the math is a little bit above our scope. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, this comes from Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell. You may have heard of him. He's got a very famous set of equations called Maxwell's equations that you'll learn all about next quarter, because they all have to do with electricity and magnetism. Um, so he was, he's a biggie, he's a big guy. Um, and he determined a formula that shows the distribution of speeds. So let me go to the board and kind of work our way to this and talk a little bit about what it looks like. All right. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to create this function f of v. Okay, and this is what we call a distribution function. So if you were to graph this, our horizontal axis is going to be V. And then we're going to have some sort of a graph here that shows us how this is distributed. So let's just say that it looks like this, okay? So this is f of v. Now, you guys have enough in your calculus toolbox for me to do things like this. Um, suppose I wanted to find out, um, first, let's say that we've got n molecules. So big N is the number of molecules of our gas. So we're using the same N that we used before. So big N is just the actual number of them. 
Okay, so if I wanted to find out how many have a velocity between uh, V1 and V2. So I'm going to specify two velocities. I'll even put them on my graph. So let's just say this is V1 and this is V2. So basically, I'm just saying, all right, I've got 20 million molecules of carbon dioxide. How many of them have velocities in this range? So the way that this is created, this f of v is created, is basically saying that if I want to find out how many are in here, I'm going to find the area here, aka integrate, and that's going to give me the portion, the fraction that lie within there. All right, so the actual number that are between V1 and V2 would be N times the integral from V1 to V2 of this guy F of V. So that's how this works. That's what this function is gonna do. This is gonna help us actually calculate how many of them are in a given speed. All right, so, um, Basically, if we were to integrate this function from zero to infinity, we're going to get one. Because 100% of them have speeds between zero and infinity. Right? If I want to find out how many of them are moving at 100 meters per second or greater, that would be an integral from 100 to infinity. Right? And so on. So that's how this works. That's how a distribution function works. Turns out that its integral is the total uh, from zero to infinity is, is going to be one, but the integral between any two, that's pretty much the probability that we're within that range. Okay. So some of the other things that we've talked about, like if we wanted to know average velocity, the average velocity, that is found by integrating from zero to infinity. But now instead of just taking f, we do v times f of v. Um, hopefully in calc, when you were doing stuff with Larry, you saw that um, if you wanted to find the average, um, you would integrate from a to b, but then you, do, uh, you multiply by that t or x or whatever your variable is. Well, that's the same thing. This is just a calculus idea. So if you want your average speed, then that's this. If you wanted to know your average square, and you may remember that this popped up when we were looking at calculating kinetic energies. But if you want to get this one, this would be the integral from 0 to infinity of v squared times f of v. So. Getting this f of v is kind of big. If we can have some sort of a function that describes that, then it gives us an alternate way, an easy way to find our um, average velocity, our average uh, square of the velocity. It's also called the RMS. I don't think I mentioned this. Um, it's called the root mean square. Yeah, it's, it's the RMS speed. Um, so you can calculate that pretty easily. But it's all dependent upon us having f v. Okay, now, I'm going to go ahead and just give this to you without proof, but we will talk about the consequences of it, like what it means and what it tells us and how this behaves. But this was um, discovered by um, Maxwell, but then also a good old Boltzmann of Boltzmann constant fame helped with it as well. But this is what it's found to be. So this is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann... Uh, distribution and it looks a little bit like this we got f of v equals okay so it's kind of gnarly but um, it's 4 pi because of course everything has a pi in it m over 2 pi 
kb times t. And all of that is raised to the 3 halves. Then we get v squared. And then there's an exponential, because again, everything should have an exponential in it. And the exponent is minus mv squared over 2 kb times t. All right, so I expect that you guys all have that memorized by Friday. That was totally a joke. Don't memorize that. <laughs> okay, so this is um, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. All right. I don't know if I can integrate that. <laughs> no, probably not. Probably not. But well, think about it. Think about um, almost everything in there is a constant. Okay, let's just look at it. So first of all, just admire its beauty. Just sit back and go, nice. And then also admire the fact that they were able to come up with this. And then that they were able to confirm it. And then that we don't have to do that. That's probably the most important thing is that we can just rely on them, <clears throat> excuse me, being correct. Okay, but now that we've admired it, Let's kind of look at what it depends on. So you, you see all those pies and stuff. Those are just constants. Um, obviously, um, they are what they are, as is KB. You notice so I showed up a couple times, the Boltzmann constant. But then other things that are in here, M, right? So M, again, remember what that is. That's just the mass. So um, it depends on what kind of particles we have, okay? It depends what their um, individual masses are, those molecules, which should make total sense. Total sense, right? How the speeds are going to be distributed should depend on how heavy they are. Heavier things, they, you know, do things differently, okay? So the mass is in there. Also, the temperature, that should make total sense. As we change temperature, we should definitely see a change in the distribution, right? So, you know, colder temperature means this should be lower, right, in general. So calculating like mean and all that, we should see a shift towards the slower velocities. Similarly, if we increase temperature, we should see a shift the other direction, right? Um, and that's it. I mean, it depends on mass and temperature. So that in itself makes kind of sense. Now the whole, well, we've got a V squared times this E to the minus V squared. Okay, that just sort of, that's where the magic happened. Um, but it definitely holds. So in terms of integrating it, and you know, Bradley I think was probably only slightly joking when he said that, um, and maybe not joking at all, but most of that is constant. Like in essence, we're being asked to integrate v squared e to the v squared. I know there's a lot of other stuff, but all that other stuff is just numbers that are constants. So in its form, it's not really terrible. I mean, it could be a lot worse, right? But um, your point is noted, though, that trying to integrate that thing um, can be kind of gnarly. All right, so what does this look like? Well, it's going to depend, again, on what M and what T we have. But basically, let's just say we've got a certain kind of molecule, so our M is fixed. So we don't have to worry about that. Let's just look at what happens when we change our T. OK, I think I'm getting kind of close to being on the low end here, so I'll try to let me I'll raise that up a little bit. All right, so this is what we're going to see for some t. Most of these graphs do something that looks like that. Now, you might be tempted to say that that's a bell curve. Um, it's related. It, it definitely comes from that probability idea. 
Um, but this would be for a specific temperature. So let's just say that this is for a given temp, let's call it T1. All right, so you see that we do start at zero and we go up towards infinity. As we go far, we see that these numbers drop down, which means it's very unlikely to have velocities that are super, super high. And that makes sense at any temperature, right? Even if you know we're at 1,000 Kelvin, we shouldn't expect to have things that are flying super, super fast. Maybe, right? There might be a few, but for the most part, they aren't. More of it is concentrated down here. And there is a peak. You can all see it, right? There's this peak right here. Well, what this velocity is, this is the most probable velocity. So wherever that peak is, that's our most probable velocity. Well, you guys all know how you could find that using calculus, right? How would you actually find that value using calculus? Take a derivative and set it equal to zero. Yep, that's a good old max-min problem. So you differentiate, set it equal to zero, find critical points, and go from there. So you could definitely find the most probable velocity and um, just by differentiating. I'll even tell you what it is. I won't make you do it on your own, but this one you could, you could confirm. It's not that terrible, but I'm going to call this VMP for most probable. So the most probable velocity is actually equal to the square root of 2 kBT divided by M. So just by doing a little calculus, differentiate, you have to use the product rule, set it equal to zero, blah, 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 blah. You find out that the most probable is actually at this point. So again, notice that the only thing that that depends on are mass and temperature. The more massive these particles are, the more massive the molecules, the lower your velocity is going to be. Oh, yeah. If I give energy to something, it's going to take more for it to speed up if it's heavier, right? Um, and then notice that it also depends on temperature. The greater the temperature, the greater that most probable velocity is. Well, we already saw that more temperature means more energy. More energy means more velocity. So it's going to slide that way. Okay, so that's your most probable. If you calculated the average velocity, so that would be, again, multiply this by V, and then integrate from zero to infinity. Uh, I will leave that as an exercise for you as well. But the average velocity, Again, only depends upon your temperature and your mass, and the same way, right? So increased temperature means you increase your average velocity. Increase mass, you decrease it. Um, it's got a different coefficient, right? This one, we just had a 2. This one's got an 8 over pi. Well, I mean, it's just how it works out mathematically. We have different average velocity than most probable. So those are different. What's most likely to occur is not the average. And that probably feels a little bit weird, but what that tells you is that this is not a bell curve. It's not symmetric. If it was symmetric, then we would see um, that these two are the same, but this is enough to show you that they're not actually quite equal. Okay, well, those are some of the velocities. Now, let's look at what happens as T increases. So if T increases, we already saw the most probable velocity has to increase as well. So 
if I were to now on the same graph, I got this one in black for temperature one, let me draw in a temperature two and I'll make it red. But we'll make it so that temperature two is greater than temperature one. So already we know that this peak has to move to the right because our most probable velocity is going to increase. But the other thing that happens, so like let's say that this is our new location of our peak. The other thing that also happens is this peak lowers. So let's make the red one here T2. So not only do we increase where that most likely temperature is, we flatten the curve a bit. All right, so why does that happen? Well, can you kind of reason it out? Why does it have to go down if we're shifting over? Go back to the idea of what the area is showing you. Remember what the area shows? It shows what's the probability that we're in a given region. So what I've really done is I've increased the width of my region. It still is from zero to infinity, but really the part that actually has any kind of height has widened. And so if I need that total area to equal one, if I widen it, I have to shorten it. So, um, in essence, what happened was we increased our most probable velocity. We also increased our average velocity, but we also allowed for a greater spread. We are much more likely now to find things over a wider interval. Right? So, like the, the different possibilities. Um, are more prevalent. Okay, so that would be like T2. If I threw in a green one, let's do a third one here for T3. Again, we shift out further, we have to flatten. So maybe this would be T3. But basically that's what's gonna happen. As, as time goes on, or time goes on, as temperature increases, we see the skew of our velocity go higher. All right, so again, where it came from, you're just gonna have to trust me on it, um, but it definitely gives us nice values. Or, well, not nice values, but values that definitely work. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that um, atmospheres get what they get in terms of particles. Because think about what's going on here. As temperature increases, uh, we increase our velocity. Well, let's say we've got a warmer body than a colder one, so a warmer area than a colder one. Um, that warmer area, we're gonna have more particles with greater velocity. Those particles are gonna be able to move away more rapidly. And if we're talking like gravity, now those gases have a greater chance of escaping. All right, this would be why mercury does not have an atmosphere. So th think about that. Let's tie together some of the things that we've seen. I'm, I'm going to switch views here because probably going to want to use my hands. What's Mars' excuse then? <laughs> uh, Mars' excuse is multiple. We'll get there. Okay. All right, so let's go to Mercury first. So Mercury, very close to the sun. So it's really hot. So since it's really hot, that distribution is gonna be skewed towards the greater velocities. Also, Mercury is small. Because it's small, it's gonna have a small gravitational attraction. And we saw that escape velocity depended upon the, the gravity, right, gravitational force. 
So Mercury's kind of got like a double thing going for it. It's small and it's hot. Because of both of those, the particles, any, you know, if it had an atmosphere at some point, and I actually don't know. I don't know if in its lifetime it had atmosphere. I've, I've not studied, um, I've not studied planetary physics to that level. Um, but if it did, it went away fast because all those particles are going to be moving. Many of them are going to be above escape velocity and eventually they're going to run away. Okay, so then you get to things like Venus. Now, Venus cools down-ish. Venus is kind of crazy because Venus actually has, a, has an immense atmosphere, like super, super cloudy um, and like nasty cloudy, like sulfuric acid rain kind of cloudy um, and huge pressure cloudy. Like if you were to um, be on the surface of Venus, you wouldn't last very long. You're going to get crushed, uh, let alone, you know, the acid eating you away. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the Russians did send probes to Venus um, and they were able to transmit for just a short amount of time before they couldn't handle the heat and pressure and, and stuff anymore. So um, that's one of the reasons why we don't send a lot of stuff to Venus because it's not going to last. But anyway, so Venus is bigger, right? Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Venus is almost the same size as Earth. It's pretty close. Um, so it's got a similar gravity. That gravity helps hold things in, right? Um, but it's also quite warm. It's warmer than Earth. And that's why it ends up having a different distribution in the atmosphere, different stuff. Um, but then you also get the fact that as all that builds up, that pressure helps hold things in, you know? So um, it's really cloudy, kind of like the Earth is pretty cloudy, um, a lot of atmosphere. Um, just because of everything worked out quite right. Now you go to Mars. So now we're starting to cool off. So you start thinking there should be more atmosphere, but it actually doesn't, right? It, like, uh, it's got an atmosphere, but it's pretty light. A um, lot of CO2, a lot of carbon dioxide, very little oxygen, um, very different makeup from the Earth's. But its issue, the reason it doesn't have much of an atmosphere is its size. It's a lot smaller than the Earth. So it's got a smaller gravitational force, which means more of those particles can escape. Also think about it this way. When I draw that, that diagram here with those um, probabilities, like the tails get really small at the end, right? It, it drops down. But there will be some particles, some molecules that will get those velocities. And those that reach those velocities that are great enough to leave, leave, never to come back. Okay, well, that doesn't change the distribution. It just changes how often those particles get out there. But if those particles are not being made again, they'll eventually all disappear. I mean, we have that happening on Earth. There's gas that leaves the Earth's atmosphere all the time, all the time. But because of a lot of the things that the earth has going for it, um, they are reproduced and they're put back. Um, one is the life, right? I mean, with the, the whole respiration deal, but also inside the earth itself with the, um, all, all the activity, the uh, geothermal activity going on. Um, the Earth is constantly outgassing, right? You think about the eruptions that happen, um, you know, like uh, in Hawaii or Krakatoa or name your favorite volcano. Um, even ones that aren't actively erupting are still releasing gases. Like um, up where I grew up, Mount Rainier, Mount Baker, a couple of the big ones in Washington State, you constantly see gas coming out of them. You see clouds that are coming out of those volcanoes, even though they're not actively erupting, right? So um, the Earth is constantly outgassing, which is producing stuff. Now, what's going to happen to the Earth eventually? Um, eventually, we'll lose our atmosphere. 
I mean, don't worry about it. Like you guys are good. Um, your kids are good. Your kids' kids are good. Your like 500 million generations of kids are good. Well, maybe not 500 million, but lots of them. Um, because it's going to take a long time, but eventually all that atmosphere will deplete, will burn off, and you know uh, there will not be much of an atmosphere here on Earth. Um, not fun to think about, but you know eventually the Earth is screwed anyway as the sun gets larger, because uh, the sun is increasing in size. Um, it always happens with stars; they, they grow before they die. Um, so there's going to be a bit of a problem there, let alone when the sun implodes, um, if it goes nova. I don't know that the sun is going to, I think the theory is that it won't because it's not large enough. Um, but if it were to do something like that, that'd be a problem too. But uh, long term, uh, the prospects for Earth don't look good, right? Like it's, it's an awesome place to live right now. I really like having it. Um, but eventually it's going to be shitty for life. Luckily, you and I don't have to worry about that. Anyway, um, but this starts to explain a little bit about why we see what we see. Um, kind of cool, kind of cool and uh, interesting that we have to treat it a little bit differently because of the fact that it's a gas as opposed to a solid or a liquid. All right, well, um, I think that's all the new stuff I want to talk about. Um, we pretty much are done with chapter two in the volume two. So we're cruising right along. We're doing great. We got two more chapters to go. We're like perfectly on schedule. I'm liking it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the exam. As, um, I have a question we, for you real oh, quick. Yeah, go for it, Bradley. So I'm researching Titan right now for chemistry. Okay. And it's very cold there. Yes. And the core is molten but not, it's not as hot as the Earth's. It's like 900 K, okay. which is not very hot. The Earth's is like 4,300 K. Right. Um, I'm just, and it has a pretty thick atmosphere. It's got 1.45 um, atmospheres of pressure. So it's not too different from Earth's in the sense of pressure. Um, right. I'm just curious as to how something forms like that when it's really cold. Well, uh, Realize that it's different gases. gases. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, hold on. I got... That's a echo going it's on. It's mostly hydrocarbons. Right. So, so it's different gases, which um, they form differently, right? And they tend to be heavier, right? Because don't the, isn't it like, doesn't it rain methane on Titan? Yeah, there's liquid methane yeah. there. So, you know, and methane compared to a lot of other gases already is kind of heavy. And that's one that's being liquefied, right? I mean, you get condensed and, and all that. So um, those molecules are a lot heavier. So think about what that does in this formula, right? Greater mass decreases your average velocity. It also decreases your most probable velocities. Right. So they've got, you got two things going on there. You got the coldness um, and you've got the decrease in mass that makes it so that they're more likely to stay. Um, but then why they're actually able to stay as gases is because they have different properties. Um, they've got different uh, latent heats. Remember latent heat is um, what you need to change from uh, one state to another. And so if you were to put, say, the gases of Earth, so nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, you put those on Titan, you'd have a very different result. Just like if you were to take the gases on Titan and bring them to Earth, it would look completely different. So you're not exactly comparing, you know, as they say, apples and oranges or whatever, right? Um, they're not the same, but it is kind of wild that a place that cold can still have um, a lot of gas in an atmosphere like that. Um, but it's just, it's very different and kind of has to be. 
What's also interesting is the surface, temp surface temperature is almost the triple point of methane. Hmm. I did not know that. Yeah, isn't that neat? It's interesting. Yeah, for those of you who don't know what triple point is, triple point is um, the, the pressure and uh, temperature combination that makes it so that all three states of matter can exist at the same time. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a magic value. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty wild that the temperature and pressure and everything right there is just about perfect for a triple point of methane. I honestly, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around. It really is. Like how did it just randomly, luckily become that? Well, that and just, I can't picture liquid methane. I've seen liquid butane, but not methane. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I don't know. Well, have you ever seen um, liquid nitrogen? No, I haven't. Because that one, um, that, that's produced. Um, I remember as a kid, some science guy came to my elementary school and brought a thermos full of liquid nitrogen and was doing, you know, like dip the uh, a bouncy ball in it, pull it out, drop it, and it just like shatters, right? Um, but I remember him pouring some out and like it, of course, vaporizes very quickly. It, it turned to gas awfully quick, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's weird to try to think about gases as liquids. Um, but luckily we've got one that we routinely see and that's water. That one's even just weird for us to think of it as a gas because we primarily see it as a liquid. Um, but yeah, I, I can definitely see what you're saying though about trying to wrap your head around it and seeing it. All right, well, let's talk exam real fast. So uh, first of all, what it's gonna cover. So I, I went back and I looked um, and the last exam went through gravity so this one's gonna start with fluids. So um, let me just double check what that chapter number was. I think it's 15, nope, 14. Okay, so um, it's gonna start on chapter 14. So that was the fluids. All right, so that's things like um, Archimedes principle with buoyancy and all that, Pascal's law, um, Bernoulli's equation, um, the uh, um, continuity equation. I think that's the, the primary equations. Um, but so fluids, it'll be on that chapter 14. Um, and then it's going to continue on. So the next thing we did was simple harmonic motion. That was chapter 15. So that's looking at um, the spring mass system, pendulums, rotation, anything that exhibits simple harmonic motion. Um, and that's where your acceleration is proportional to your position, but points in the opposite direction, right? That's what it means to get into simple harmonic motion. So um, things to be able to do there, um, basically the find out, you know, how much energy is in it, um, you know, different positions at different times, create equations for them. Um, find periods, that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, that was chapter 15 was harmonic motion, which then led into um, waves. So chapter 16 was all about waves. So the important things there are things like the wave equation, um, the fact that it depends on both position and time. And so the different kind of numbers that are involved period, wave number, amplitude, wavelength, right? Um, those kind of things. Um, the physical phenomena that happen. So things like uh, interference, so constructive and destructive interference. Um, we also talked about specific kinds of waves like waves on strings and then getting standing waves. Um, that led into chapter 17, which was sound but it was really still talking sound, but now we're talking about waves in air, so pressure waves. So uh, again, things to be able to do with waves is things like, um, you know, get the equations, figure out the important things, 
uh, determine um, energy, power, whatnot, be able to put them together, superimpose them, right? Add them together, you get another wave. Um, figure out where you get destructive interference or constructive interference and the like, right? Um, and then when it comes to sound, the big things in sound are just how sound waves work. Um, a little bit on like the speed of sound, the intensity of sound, um, but then uh, really looking at the effects of sound. So things like beats, right? When your waves are just slightly out of frequency, um, standing waves, so like, uh, what happens when you you know blow across a bottle and you get that tone? Um, Doppler effect, how the apparent frequency changes, um, and stuff like that. Um, so that was sound, and then um, we moved on to thermodynamics. But I think that that's where I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it as just through chapter 17 through sound. Okay, so um, really it's the, the four chapters. So you've got fluids, simple harmonic motion, so oscillations, waves, and sound. So I'll save thermodynamics for the final. You can basically plan right now that the final is gonna be like 80% thermodynamics. Okay, so the stuff from volume two, so heat and so far heat and gases. Um, but we're going to start spending time looking at the um, other laws of thermodynamics. Um, talk about stuff like entropy and, and things like that. So that will then round out the, the final exam. Okay, so that's what's going to be on there. Um, recommendations, of course, are to go back and look at the homeworks and, and kind of practice some. Um, find other problems from the book especially those that you know you've got the answers to. Like I think the odds are available on that online. Um, you know, try some of them, see if you can get the same values. Um, but I think at this point, you guys generally know what to do. Um, also expect the format for the exam to be about the same. It, it'll be pretty similar where I give um, a handful of theory questions, right? More conceptual, what's going on in addition to the ones where you actually calculate. Um, in terms of the timing, we'll do the same thing where I will open it at three o'clock. So like the usual time. Um, and then uh, you need to get it turned in. I know the syllabus says six. Jacob actually is like, the syllabus said six. Why did I say 5.30? Um, I actually want to make it 5.30. That way you've got the two hours for the exam and then the half hour to deal with whatever weirdness um, might happen with technology. So. Uh, we'll plan on the same setup. Um, there are a couple of you that do alternate tiny timing. Um, let me know um, what you want to do with that. I will wait until I hear from you in terms of well, what we end up going with. Um, but if you're someone that needs a little extra time for whatever reasons or you need to take it at a slightly different time, um, you guys know who you are. Uh, talk to me and we'll get that figured out. But with that, how about I open it up to you guys. Questions? Like now that I start talking about that, you go, oh, wait a minute. I don't remember anything about topic A. Anything we want to talk about? I'm just curious if stuff we're working on right now with gases would explain fluids a little bit better. Probably not really, huh? Uh, you know, I, I can't think of anything about it that would really explain it because what we were doing with fluids was more macroscopic right it was bigger picture um it might help see why say gases can travel at faster velocities um i know for sure it could it might help you understand why sound travels differently because sound requires the, basically the contact of particles, the interaction of particles. And now that we've talked more about that with gases, it explains why the speed of sound is a little bit different in gas versus liquid. Um, 
So there probably are a few places where it sort of overlaps, but I wouldn't say that there's anything big fundamentally that would help you there. But as always, good question. All right, well, it's sounding like we're pretty good here. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. Let me just pause the recording.